This video is going to be about inductive and abductive reasoning, the tools we use every day to make predictions, solve mysteries, and build stronger arguments. Today, we're going to break down how these forms of reasoning work, their strengths, their flaws, and why Sherlock Holmes would make a great philosopher. Inductive reasoning, how we predict the future. Inductive reasoning is how we take what we already know and use it to predict what will likely happen next. It's the backbone of science, decision-making, and even common sense. Here's how it works. Premise one, every time you've taken aspirin, your headache went away. Premise two, Aspirin has worked for thousands of people before. Conclusion, this aspirin will probably cure your headache too. Or let's say, premise one, every Marvel movie you've seen has been entertaining. Premise two, the same directors, actors, and writers are involved. Conclusion, this new Marvel movie will probably be great. Notice how inductive reasoning never guarantees that the conclusion is true. It just makes it highly probable. Maybe this Marvel movie will be terrible. Maybe today is the day aspirin stops working. Inductive reasoning gives us strong but uncertain conclusions, which is why it's so useful but also risky. The problem with induction, it's not foolproof. One major flaw of induction is that the future doesn't always resemble the past. Let's take a classic example. Premise. Every swan I've ever seen is white. Conclusion. All swans must be white. Seems reasonable, right? But the first time someone discovered a black swan, that entire assumption collapsed. Philosopher Nelson Goodman highlighted this problem with his famous Gru thought experiment. Imagine a new color called Gru, something that is green before a certain time, let's say next year, but turns blue after that. If all emeralds we've ever seen are green, we assume they will always be green. But by that same logic, if all emeralds we've seen are Gru, we should assume they'll all turn blue next year. Wait. So are they going to stay green or turn blue? Both conclusions seem valid, yet they contradict each other. Goodman's point, inductive reasoning, while powerful, can sometimes lead to logical traps. So how do we get closer to the truth? Enter abductive reasoning. Abductive reasoning, Sherlock Holmes' secret weapon. Inductive reasoning predicts the future based on patterns, but abductive reasoning is different. It's about figuring out the most likely explanation given the evidence at hand. As Sherlock Holmes famously said, when you have eliminated the impossible, whatever remains, however improbable, must be the truth. Abduction isn't about certainty. It's about finding the best possible explanation when you don't have all the facts. Example, the case of the disappearing student. Let's say your friend Anna hasn't been in physics class since the midterm. What's the best explanation? She's sick. She switched to another class. She was abducted by aliens. You don't know for sure, but given that she's still attending other classes... She's probably not sick, and since she failed the midterm, it makes sense that she might have dropped the class. The alien abduction theory? Highly unlikely, unless you have some wild evidence. So, you use abduction to conclude, Anna probably dropped the class. Abduction in real life. We use abductive reasoning all the time, whether it's doctors diagnosing diseases, detectives solving crimes, or just figuring out why your Wi-Fi stopped working. Inductive reasoning would say, my Wi-Fi has never failed before, so it will never fail. Abductive reasoning says, the Wi-Fi was working fine this morning, but now my router is flashing red. The best explanation is that my internet service is down. Unlike deduction, which gives absolute certainty, and induction, which deals in probabilities, abduction is about best guesses based on available evidence. How arguments work counter-arguments, and the Socratic method. Now that we know how to reason inductively and abductively, let's talk about how philosophers argue. Step one, make an argument. Let's say you argue, Socrates probably had a beard because most men in ancient Athens had beards. This is an inductive argument. It's based on patterns from historical evidence. Step two, the counter-argument. Now, someone challenges you. Actually, Gorgias, a rival of Socrates, claimed that Socrates was incapable of growing a beard and used fake beard clippings to cover it up. That's a counter-argument. But how do we know if it's true? Step 3. Counter-counter-argument. Now, you respond. Gorgias was known to be a gossip and had personal reasons to spread lies about Socrates. So, his claim isn't reliable. The best explanation is still that Socrates had a beard. Here, you've used abductive reasoning. You've eliminated unreliable information and kept the most plausible explanation. The Socratic method, the art of arguing. This exchange of arguments and counter-arguments is known as the Socratic method, a process where philosophers debate ideas to get closer to the truth. Unlike everyday arguments, where people just try to win, 
Philosophical debates aren't about scoring points. They're about finding the strongest, most logical position. A good philosopher isn't afraid to change their mind when faced with better reasoning. In fact, if you're never wrong, you're probably not thinking hard enough. Now that you understand induction and abduction, you can spot weak arguments, make stronger cases, and think more critically. If you enjoyed this breakdown, hit like, subscribe, and let me know in the comments. What's the worst argument you've ever heard? Thanks for watching.